obviously, thank you for coming. Um, today's presentation will just be a high-level abstract overview. Um, you know, I doubt a one-hour presentation would do this subject matter justice, let alone a 20-minute or so presentation. But if you want to dig in deeper, not to worry. Um, I have prepared an awesome markdown list. Do you guys know what the awesome lists on GitHub are? So anyways, I prepared a list of uh, tons of links with papers, code, data sets, and it'll be updated and refined regularly, and I'll be sharing that link with you at the end of the, the talk. Um, also, if you want to code socially, uh, uh, you're more than welcome to come to some of the TensorFlow hacks uh, I, I organize, where we just, uh, you know, it's one thing to read a paper or just go through a GitHub repo on your own. It's, it's quite another to implement it practically, and you have that little bug uh, dependency that breaks everything. At least here in a group, you can, you know, um, you know, share some insights or experience. Okay, so um, before we start, um, oops, the clicker. Um, it's okay, I can use the this. Okay, so just, uh, uh, not to worry. Um, can I get a quick survey? Uh, lift, you know, it's very controversial when I speak to some of my developer uh, friends whether uh, which term they prefer. So can I just, and people are very passionate, right? Uh, I, I, I've seen. Okay, so this works. Great, thanks a lot. Um, how many of you prefer, prefer the term machine learning? Okay, how many of you prefer, prefer the term AI? Wow, <laughs> one person. Okay, um, how, how many of you say it depends? I don't know, what, why, why do you guys like machine learning rather than AI? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Just, I'm curious to find out. Did you, uh, oh, you were you were saying you uh, wanted to be an AI. AI yeah. Oh, why why do you guys prefer machine learning? It's pretty unanimous. Right? Inflation of expect, expectancy. Expectancy. Yeah, like people, the media hyping up AI. Yeah. Is any any other reason, guys? No, it's fine. AI is a broad church. Machine learning is just, just exists. More task specific, yeah. and and you know you can deliver on that as well. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it really. Um, oops, I let that. But, uh, you know, if today I said, you know, today I'm going to introduce you to, uh, you know, MNIST, right? Or this cool new thing, MNIST, or uh, Inception, or MobileNet, your reaction would probably be something like this. You know, TensorFlow is a bit of a victim of its own success, right? Because, um, you know, the people, you know, the image recognition, speech recognition, a lot of these tasks that we associate now with maybe... AI broadly, but specific tasks kind of have been solved, and, and in effect, they've been, um, you know, probably solved better than, than um, human capabilities, right? Um, you know, if you do like something like capture, it's um, you know, it, image capture. If the the line is, a, if the image is a bit blurry, I'm sometimes like, yeah, that was indeed a fire hydrant storefront or traffic light or whatever. Um, but you know the we need to kind of, we kind of forget how it was uh, a bit like just a short while ago. You know, if you wanted to just do just a couple of years ago, you know, do um, you know apples and oranges, just compare two image categories. Um, how would you do it without TensorFlow? Anybody tried to tackle this problem pre-TensorFlow? Yeah. Well, how would you do it? I'm curious. No, pre-TensorFlow. <laughs> Pre See, you, you, we're, we're so accustomed that. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is how I did it, because I had to deal with this. Um, you would do something like, um, you know, use P PIL, which is a Python imaging library, uh, and try to say, okay, I, I try to look at the color, I try to look at the texture, and you write all these rules and all these functions, uh, and then you try to have something as generalizable as possible. But sooner or later, you have something like this, right? And that doesn't fit in, you know, in either one of your rules, and then you have to rewrite a rule just for that, and so it doesn't break. But, you know, um, you know now you, you, we have ResNet, Inception, MobileNet. We're spoiled for choice. Um, and, and, yeah. Um, but the thing is, a lot of these um, advances have been a long time coming, right? If we look at... Um, if we look at you know convolutional neural networks, which are responsible for a lot of the image rec recognition stuff, you know it, it was pretty much proposed around uh, 1989, right? And but then it really only kind of took off uh, in 2010 
with the ImageNet, you know, millions of images that were labeled. And, and yeah, sh a short while later, uh, you know, <coughs> there was really, uh, um, really accurate uh, object classification. And you know, the same thing with the Q learning algorithm and the game playing. So what we're seeing is that really fundamentally data sets are, are critical. Um, so we're, we're seeing the emergence of big data sets in the graph sphere, right? We've got movie lens with a million edges, Reddit, uh, which has a, um, a, a data set with 11 million edges. So the question now is, you know, why not? Why don't we have um, uh, a big breakthrough in, in graph data and, and recommendations? Um, is it that maybe graph data is just not important, right? Um, let's put that notion to rest, just in case there's any doubt. Um, can anyone tell me, I've got some chocolate here. Can anyone tell me any search engines that were in existence around the time Google came uh, about and that is no longer with us today? Alta Vista, okay, that's good, you get one. Where are you? Who said Alta Vista? Okay, well, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll pass you, I'll pass the key. Did you say Alta Vista? All right. Okay, uh, uh, this, I was going to throw it, but then I, I, I'm afraid of hitting people. But anybody else Alta Vista, besides Alta Vista? Lycos. Lycos, yes. No, you can't say Apple. Uh, I think it's still in existence today, even though it's a bit of a good Anybody else? Alta Vista? Um, Lycos? Hmm? Yahoo. No, not besides Yahoo. Ask Cheese. Ask Cheese, yeah, kind of, kind of. Yes, it's true. Um, here, just pass it off. And, uh, okay, anyone else? Last chance, and then we're done. Okay, so the point is, it's really hard to remember these, and they're all in the dustbins of history, right? Uh, you know, there's Excite, InfoSeq, WebCrawler, a bunch of these. Um, but, of course, all these engines are essentially gone, like I'm sure some of that chocolate will soon be. But, you know... Uh, Arguably, the main reason for Google's victory is the graph data of the web it generated and the algorithms that were built on top of it, like PageRank, right? Which would rank pages um, um, based on links that were pointed to it. Um, of course, pages themselves had domain authority, but it was, say, it was looking, okay, how many uh, pages are linking to this? Then it's important. And who are these pages that are linking to this? Are they trustworthy? And it was sort of a, a, a graph data set, and it focused on that. Um, of course, the other search engines, they didn't really focus on graph data. Um, they focused uh, on non-graph data, like the frequency of, um, you know, keywords, right? And so what would happen is these people would try to, um, you know, game the system. They would have the keyword like a zillion times, but in white, which was the color of the background, invisible to humans, but visible to, you know, the, the search engine bots. Um, so what is generally considered the second largest search engine right now? Hmm? Anybody? Uh, okay. Kind kind of, but uh, uh, it's bigger than dot dot com. It's considered. Hmm? No, no, it's it's YouTube, YouTube. I think so. Th there's tons of search engines going on searches uh, on on YouTube every day. Um, there's a billion hours uh, watched daily. How many of those hours do you think? were the result of clicks from search results as opposed to <coughs> recommendations. A hundred million? Just raise your hand whenever you think it is. A hundred million? Two hundred million? Three hundred million? Four hundred million? Five hundred million? Six hundred million? Seven hundred million? Eight hundred million? Nine hundred million? You guys are pretty close, you know, I it's just... Anyways, I'm... Uh, so it's about eight hundred million and uh, about eighty percent, you know, and it's an astounding number. Um, you know, if, if we look at something like Amazon, you know, we all are kind of aware with AWS, but in the e-commerce division generated an astounding $140 billion last year. Um, how, how much more likely do you think a sale was the result of um, just a search result or a landing page as opposed to a recommendation? Uh, it was twice as likely, three times as likely, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine ten, ten times more likely. Um, so, anyways, so, uh, you know, gra clearly graph data and recommendations are hugely important to many of the web giants. And uh, that importance will just increase over time as we have more and more data and we need to sift through it. 
I think right now, I think some of you have probably seen these numbers, where we're expected to be at 44 trillion gigabytes by 2020. That's 300 times more than in 2005. 80 to 90 percent of the world's digital data has been generated in the past 22 years, past in the past two years, excuse me. That's an, uh, a figure that's branded about a lot. And then 1.7 megabytes per human uh, per second is the actual growth in data right now. Um, so, yeah, so why has TensorFlow not taken over graph data? Um, the, you know, it's, first and foremost, you know, graph data does not need TensorFlow to be useful. It can exist out, totally outside of tensor, so, TensorFlow uh, and quite a bit effectively. Um, just to recap kind of what graph data is, just in case we, uh, so we're on, on the same uh, page. The, you know, this is uh, an example that's brandied about often, but uh, the, um, the, the, these are nodes, the circles are nodes, and the links between the nodes are edges, and they essentially can be anything, right? Um, in this case, they're characters and they're relations, and it can get really complex, you know, the, the uh, edges can be uni unidirectional, right? Morpheus knows Trinity, but Trinity doesn't know Morpheus, uh, but, um, you know, even, even, and the whole thing is a graph, right? The whole uh, web of connections. And actually, even edges and nodes in and of themselves can be graphs. Uh, but it can get pretty, pretty complex. Um, and recommendations is essentially a link prediction problem. Hey, you know what? Maybe Morpheus should know the architect or something like that, right? Um, and, and, and we try to do that. And of course, you can replace that with like uh, product items, content, or, or, or whatever you'd like. Um, let's come back to YouTube for a second. Uh, this is this is a, actually an interview question. Sometimes, how would how would you improve YouTube's uh, recommendations? Any t any takers? You can you can use any kind of attributes or you know what, what would be the you know it, somebody just just uploaded uh, a video that account was created one week ago. They uploaded it. Um, what, how would you would you boost that? Would you rank it higher or lower? Any takers? No? Okay, so you can, you can have a bunch of factors. Uh, point being is that, like, you can say, like, the length of the video, if it's a new account, hey, wait, hold on, maybe we should, uh, you know, uh, put that account on probation, we're not sure if it's a spammer. Um, the, the, the YouTube engineering team, uh, you know, not to worry, even the YouTube engineering team struggles to put all these rules, you know, if... Some of you might remember that YouTube used to be very clickbaity at a certain point, where you had like a thumbnail and a title, you clicked, and that had nothing to do with it, what you, you clicked through. Um, but, uh, uh, but that was solved, and, and there was a rule that was put in place, hold on, we need to pay attention to the watch time, right? And, and, and that was an important part of the, of the graph da data, one of the things that was taken into consideration. Um, because people that would did the clickbait, they would listen to it for like, uh, watch it for like uh, a second and then move on to something else, right? And we thought, oh, that, that was great. But then we had, um, you know, we have these long videos that are a bit extremist, polarizing, you know, Illuminati, deep state taking over, whatever. And, yeah. and, you know, you have some people that watch that a lot throughout from the beginning to the end. And then it gets promoted to everybody else. And, and, and right now there's a whole, you know, controversy around that, you know. And uh, YouTube just kind of made an announcement that we're going to uh, change our, our algorithms again. Um, but, you know, the problem is, 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 is not, it's not just YouTube, right? It's just, you know, Facebook as well is taking out ads on double-decker buses and saying, you know what, Facebook's going to be about recommend stuff about your friends again. Um, but uh, fundamentally, what we're noticing is the limits of feature engineering, right? We try to write, write features bit by bit, bit by bit. There's just so much data, so many different aspects and factors and variables to take into consideration. You write for something, and then you neglect something else, right? Um, and, and, and that's what happened with images, right? If you try to write features for images, it gets really complex. You try to write for apple oranges, you get that third thing. Um, so it's better to do deep learning. Um, and actually, it's a really interesting time right now for graph data and recommendations, because we've got this glut of information, and we're realizing the limits of feature engineering. And everybody's kind of saying, you know what? We should uh, give... Um, um, we should give deep learning, uh, TensorFlow a try, and see how that... And people are realizing that that's maybe a better use of 
uh, the time of you know highly paid engineers rather than um, you know trying to rewrite the rules, just write something that uh, that that works say with TensorFlow, and you don't have to recode it for each use case. Um, but then, the, is, can we not just port established TensorFlow algorithms to, to graph data, um, like convolutional convolutional uh, neural networks, and call it a day? Um, you know, the problem is most of the advances like image and speech recognition are fundamentally based on Euclidean mathematics. Um, anybody, any takers that want to explain Euclidean mathematics? Exactly, yeah. So plane geometry, Euclid was uh, this Greek mathematician 2,000 years ago, wrote this book, The, Element, um, the Elements, and, and then he outlined the geometric properties that, uh, uh, of objects that exist in flat 2D planes. Um, it had a list of assumptions, like uh, two points determine a unique line, any terminated line may be extended definitely, a circle may be drawn with any given point of center and any given radius, all right angles are equal. These assumptions lead to, uh, uh, you extend it and there's some interesting conclusions, right? Shortest distance between two points will always be a straight line, interior angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, two parallel lines will never cross, right? Um, but, um, and based on, uh, um, Based on that, you could um, you could do a bunch of cool mathematical things, right? And images are essentially grids. Heck, this looks like a grid, right? So um, this is Bob Ross. Anybody know Bob Ross? Or no? Yeah, he's a ch chill, really. So I, if ever you're stressed, I suggest you go to YouTube and type uh, Bob Ross paintings. But uh, but anyway, so this is a painting. Let's rearrange the pixels a bit and see what it gets. This, right? Of course, this is not just a little bit, right? But, but you get the point. You can't just rearrange um, uh, um, pixels and, and call it day. There's, um, if you look at graphs, right, you totally can, right? This graph, uh, the earlier example, um, is the same as this, right? We move them around, but, you know, there's no meaning lost, right? The relationships, the edges, they're all the same. Yes? Sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yes. Um, okay, so... Let's, uh, okay, so let's bring it. So there have been many attempts. Uh, Deepwalk and Node2Vec are some notable uh, attempts. So you're probably familiar with Word2Vec. That's really popular in TensorFlow dealing with a text. Basically with Node2Vec, the idea was to uh, linearize or sequentialize graph data. You know, like A is a friend of B. You just say that, that's a sentence and everything. But in text, the number of words is relatively limited. But with graph nodes and embeddings, it does not scale well because um, essentially uh, the you know to keep the the word analogy, uh, a word may have three or four definitions, but in this implementation, it, it could take a whole lot more uh, definitions if depending on the number of edges. Um, it lacks the ability to for generalization. Uh, has to be retrained from the beginning. Whatever a new node is added to the graph. Um, it's basically not suitable for dynamic graphs and web data, right? That's constantly changing. There have been quite a, uh, a few other attempts, um, but most essentially suffer from the same problem. You have to retrain each time, and when you train, you need to load the entire graph, which ha creates memory problems and limits it to about 100,000 nodes, which is not very useful. Um, anyways, but what's really interesting right now is this. So graph sage, and maybe we're on the cusp of maybe a breakthrough in the graph data space. So uh, graph sage has a bunch of different variants, and most notably pin sage, which is used by pin Pinterest. Anybody here know of Pinterest or uses Pinterest? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so Pinterest is just like images, you pin them, and, and that's that, right? Um, it's, it's essentially, it deals with billions of nodes, and there's 200 million plus users, right? Um, so the previous approaches would we, we try to avoid memory problems by doing something called a uh, K-hop uh, graph neighborhood. So say, just follow the graph, the node, two degrees, right, twice, or something like that. But this approach uh, is sometimes inaccurate for the recommendations. So what happens is uh, th this new approach uh, performs localized convolutions by sampling the neighborhood around a node and dynamically constructing a computation graph. Um, it essentially um, avoids the need to operate on the entire graph during training. It basically defines the importance around neighborhoods by, by simulating random walks and selecting the, neighbor, the, the, the neighbors with the highest visits. Anybody here uh, know random walks? Uh, from, 
All right, so uh, I, I won't uh, go on through that, but basically, uh, in a nutshell, random walk, um, you know, but, but uh, is, is basically if you flip a coin, uh, there was a mathematician um, that, that, that went on a random walk and, and bumped into a couple all the time. And uh, they said, well, maybe this isn't all random after all, right? And, and tried to work the math. In essence, the conclusion of a random walk is that uh, if you, like, say, flip a coin and you've got an integer scale, plus or minus, uh, plus one if it's heads, minus one if it's tails, um, the sooner or later there's going to be, uh, it's going to coalesce towards um, a bell curve. You, 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 the more you flip it, um, you might go to the edges, but most, most of your occurrences are going to be here. So it uses that, says, you know what, we don't need to go through the whole graph. Let's just look at what's most likely um, going to be crossed. Uh, so it, it makes it more efficient. So you, you bring in a node here, and you don't need to retrain everything. You just do it very local. Um, so and you don't have to choose an arbit arbitrary number of steps. And you can use MapReduce. They've used MapReduce to avoid repeating computations for overlapping uh, neighborhoods uh, of nodes. And it seems to scale well. Um, 3 billion nodes and 18 billion edges, and that is scale. Um, so you, uh, you might be asking yourself, why not just use image recognition if it's just images? Well, this actually outperformed images. Why? Because sometimes two images look alike and you used uh, Inception, um, but they're not the same. Or sometimes some images don't look alike, but they're kind of related, and you want to recommend them. So um, where to from here? And this is uh, the conclusion. Um, you know, hopefully there will be a gradual simplification of models. ResNet started with 152 layers, and over time we, reali we realized that most of those layers were not crucial. Um, we, have m we have more efficient inception mobile net with far few fewer layers. And who knows, one, one day maybe we'll have a, a model uh, in the browser and have real-time uh, graph recommendations in the browser with maybe something like TensorFlow.js. Uh, maybe we can have some tensor, tensor transfer learning. Sorry, that that can boost the popularity, um, you know, of, of the models. Um, before we have that, there will be a need. Uh, there will need to be a consensus on the data formats uh, and the conventions for graph data. With images and models, we have JPEG, and if, even if you're not aware of it, that all the images are resized uh, to fill, fit a particular pixel grid. Um, it's not the case with graph uh, data. Uh, everybody has their preference. And one thing that's really cool now is, is graph generative networks that have shown remarkable progress. Everybody heard of the AlphaFold in DeepMind? So they, there was a protein folding uh, contest basically to discover interesting uh, uh, molecules in, in, in pharmaceutical research. And uh, DeepMind basically uh, outranked everybody uh, by a lot, even having no uh, pharmaceutical insight and beat like Pfizer and a bunch of huge pharm uh, pharmaceutical companies, essentially using kind of graph generative uh, networks. Now, uh, it could be applied to rec web, web recommendations, where you could say, uh, you know, uh, people are constantly trying to uh, game uh, web recommendations. If a platform is huge enough, you could have this kind of adversarial, generative adversarial framework that could actually compete and you uh, and see, okay, this is a worthy thing. It's not a fake recommendation trying and trying to pass off as a real recommendation. Um, okay, so D DeepMind has released GraphNet, which is built on top of TensorFlow, and it's not precisely for recommendations, but it's still rudimentary, but it, allow it gives us the community a foundation to build on, and spend less time with operations and, and more time with fine-tuning models. Um, so in conclusion, if you want, want ready-to-go models that can be easily installed with Docker or run in a notebook with a few lines, Graph recommender systems is, is probably not for you. But for some of you, that, that may be precisely what you find appealing, right? You may have been, gotten bored or complacent uh, with the successes of TensorFlow uh, and um, in image recognition or speech recognition. Um, th there's still a whole lot to do in graph for recommendations, and it's still relatively early days. I hope that um, I've impressed, uh, impressed upon you how important graph recommendations can be and will continue to be and that you can take away with you some concepts that help you navigate um, uh, the, this area. There's a GitHub link here um, with a bunch of links, um, a list of links, so you can dig in deeper, and um, it'll be regularly updated. And if you want to hack and, and, and get practical, you're more than just speak to me. I'll make sure to um, add you to the list so you get invited to the thing, to the hack. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh,
Does anyone have a question for, for Yaz? Yes. Yes, that is not a good question. Uh, yep, right over here. Um, what do you think about recommendations? You just, if you can let us know your name, just so we know. And uh, Manuel, and Ron from, from Reddit. Cool. If you think about uh, recommendation uh, systems for YouTube, um, what is your metric? So um, I would imagine maybe you want people to stay on um, as long as possible. Mm. But it's not necessarily the best video to show them. So sometimes if I'm just interested in doing one very good video, maybe I'm content after watching it. This was the best yeah, I'm... For me. What do you do with that fact that you, um, to some extent, really um, steer the people to, to videos that um, might not be the best one in, in general? Yeah. I mean, there's a whole, there, there's so many theories and approaches for this feature engineering. You know, notably, Facebook tries not to be too relevant, right? You think, okay, optimize for relevancy and give them exactly what they're looking for. But, but there's been this thing where uh, eureka moment, they call it. So show some things that are irrelevant and then something super relevant. And then you're like, hey, yeah, you feel like you're discovering things. And you get like, apparently there's some psychological research that you get, like a dopamine boost or something. Um, and then there's others say, no, show everything. Um, and uh, you, you could get really complex, right? You're saying optimize time, right? Um, and, and, but then at what time is that user visiting? Day, night, and, and, and maybe pr particularly if they're visiting at work, uh, during work, regular work hours, maybe you want to do the first thing that you said, not, not optimize for time. And maybe they're, they're at home after 7 p.m. Maybe you want to show them more and, and get... So it, it, there's so many factors. Um, I, you know, it's, I, I'm not clearly, I'm definitely not aware of all of them, but the point is, is, is it, it, it get, it's getting too complex and, and, and people are realizing that, you know, everyone thinks they have the key and, and even the top teams and the top, uh, you know, tech companies don't have, uh, are, not, are not performing well, so. Yeah. Sure, sure. Well, you know, there's there's always a fine line. Like, you don't want to show people too many ads because they might, uh, you know, bring an ad blocker or something, right? Or you might you might not want people to spend too much money because they might feel guilty and quit Amazon and cut their Amazon Prime account. Um, it's 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 not as linear as you know, just maximize for everything. It's it's really like the you, you, the user is you know uh, the life cycle of the user, especially in companies. Uh, like these, the, you, you, the, there's a really long life cycle, so you definitely don't want to push for it. Um, the the, the metric, there, there, there are definitely, I think, I th if I understand correctly, you're like, what do you, what metrics do you optimize for, right? But you have different teams that will say, All right, let's opt based on what I said, you know, optimize for, let's make tons of money, and then say, no, 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 life life cycle, we need to care for our customers and. Besides, we're getting Amazon Prime money, so let's relax. Or, it, it, you know, there's always like these internally, like these teams that are vying for attention and everything. So, but sooner or later, some of their uh, approaches are, you know, uh, don't work out. Um, okay. So, how do you deal with the fact that um, if you change your recommendation system, you also change uh, the behavior of the viewers? And um, you mentioned at the beginning that 80 percent of the views are recommended, so yeah. um, you might actually have a lot of feedback. Yeah, yeah, there's tons of feedback, right? So uh, you know, absolutely, that that's it. You know, like if you look at clickstream data, right? You know, people clicking, how much they click, how what they're followed, and everything. That that's that accounts for a big chunk of actually the growth in data. Obviously, we're not generating 1.7 megabytes per, per, per second of data, we're not taking a photo every second, but whenever we browse, whenever that data gets stored and mined and everything, um, they, and, and that, that's getting unmanageable, right? Um, even kind of trained data scientists. Um, but but you, if you're looking, or you're asking me like, what would you look for if through that clickstream data? Uh, you, you could you could see you know uh, what, what, of course what you referred to uh, uh, you know who else liked it uh, 
you know, people that like the same pattern, but then you say, well, no, not like the same pattern. Um, you know, pe people try to take advantage of that with advertising, and there's a bit of, you know, uh, to, you know, there's a whole field called psychographics, right, that will kind of say, uh, like, let's, there's people, what are their elemental needs, and things like that, and they apply it to that. Um, it, it, it's, I, I don't even bother with it, right? I mean, I, I'm looking forward to the day when, you know, like we can be like with images and, and, and trust the model and just say, okay, we'll, we'll feed it as much as data as possible and the more data, the better it gets. Uh, and, and we can fine tune it, the hyperparameters and everything and focus on that, you know. But anyways. To, to that point, yeah. uh, an area where Selden are interested, we talked a little bit about this earlier on, Alex referenced explanation yes, around yes. Kind, of, kind of neural network models. Uh, presumably kind of graph net models, that's they're, they're kind of very complex, yes. very impenetrable and opaque. Yeah. What are you using? Are you using kind of any explanation techniques to surface wide what they're up to? Yeah, yeah, you can use different tools. So, you know, Neo4j is actually not bad if you're not, uh, they, they, they have a neat database and you can, uh, if you're working with uh, business-oriented people, uh, they can see it. Their uh, query language is, is, is relatively legible. Um, you don't have to be like a coder to understand it. <laughs> what they're doing is they're bringing in uh, machine learning bit by, step by step. And, and um, I think it's early days to, to say that there still isn't even uh, like an agreed uh, you know, model or, or, or framework. Um, I, I think um, it, it will be it will be interesting when when you do some user feedback and you say, hey, uh, why did you like that? Bring a focus group. But um, it, it will be tricky to. I mean, there, there's this point, there's always this uh, criticism of TensorFlow that can be a bit black box. Um, but but if, if you are um, optimizing and you have you sit, you have a team that says, okay, we optimize for these metrics bottom line or watch time or whatever that team is focused on at that time, you know. So I have one observation. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I think something is missing in that ecosystem, which would be principle for graphs. Mm -hmm. So they used to have, well, I used to use a, a project, a process project called Gephi that was really good actually to sell graph-based recommendation or system to business people. Yeah. But that project is less and less supported, and I think Google would be in a great place to work on such a subject. That's my first observation. My question for you is about how you manage the topology as a graph. Mm -hmm. Because depending on the topology, you might be an easier potential victim of an attack. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking in terms of, uh, I don't know, uh, connected components or in terms of sparsity of the graph, do you also optimize for this or do you only optimize for, uh, let's say, business-related metrics or, or viewership-related metrics? Because, for example, you could imagine or you, you can predict with some sparse graph how the propagation of some source of information or some good or bad content is going to spread through the graph. So if you optimize for this, you can actually decide that you're cutting that edge that is connecting uh, basically potential victims of that propagation. Is that also something that you're optimizing for? Yeah, that's actually interesting. I think with, with uh, generative adversarial networks, there's like uh, conditional adversarial networks now that are showing a lot of promise and you could it's not there yet I mean this is very bleeding edge but like you could literally bring in some conditions like you said um, you it's it, it's just a, a company a couple companies that have this problem right if you have a user facing and you're like a huge platform uh, Instagram whatever everyone's trying to growth hack or or be more popular and everything um, and, and a lot of those are just like rules, but um, it's it's really sad when you see, for instance, I know that there's you know rules in place where if you're a new account and you're posting great content, you just don't get ranked higher uh, just because you're a new a new account. And 
And right now, that's the way it is, right? Uh, you could do uh, whatever you want on Instagram or on YouTube. You'll, you'll be throttled because you're a new account. Um, and, and actually, I, I think maybe there's, for, for these people, there, there's a whole group of people that could be great content producers and things like that that get alienated and get off the platform because they're not getting the uh, community love and support uh, they were looking for. Um, I, I think that once, when, we, when you start thinking of attacks and, and, and simulating them and, and kind of this generative adversarial framework, uh, you'll have a lot more sophisticated things, a lot more, um, you know, and, and that will actually, that will account for, I think right now when you're looking at some of the big, these big sites, that will be their competitive advantage. Because more or less, everyone's kind of using graph data. But now, and if you're a user facing, and you're trying to um, get more users, and how do you get that, you know, missed opportunity of users that, that have been alienated? Um, so, so it's not there yet, but with, if, you, if, if the material is out there, if you look at the papers with conditional adversarial networks, and you apply it to graph data, it, 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 it could be really popular. Very good. Very good. Listen, um, people have got beer to drink and, and trains to catch, so let's thank Yannis. <laughs>